I'm calling for a global bus to follow this melt up depends on how fast that comes along. If it comes before the end of the year, uh, they may be cutting sooner than, you know, than the, or faster than they think. Um, if this soft landing kind of stretches out through the, the year, you know, the cuts are going to come next year. There are going to be big cuts. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter and your host of this program. Really appreciate you joining us because we have lots to talk about yet again. It doesn't get easier, I tell you that, because lots of data is being dropped on us. Just yesterday, we had the CPI data coming out. And the market is confused by them because it, uh, it doesn't really fit the narrative, yet he's right. And uh, that, that's the interesting part, and uh, that's one of the reasons I've invited him back, because uh, he's been calling what we've been seeing in the last six months almost to a T. And uh, really curious if his views have changed, because last time he was on was uh, late September, about a month before the market really took off and rallied about 25-30%. And they're talking about the S&P 500 here. So what David's views are now um, in that regard. David, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, hi Kai. Great to be back. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, it's like I mentioned in the intro. Like your call sometimes caused a lot of controversy, which is interesting because it doesn't fit the narrative of mainstream, right? So yeah, and, that, that's my label is I'm a contrarian, <laughs> so uh, and probably the contrarian out there. So uh, yeah, I'm most comfortable when everybody thinks I'm. <laughs> I'm crazy. So, <laughs> absolutely no, fantastic. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we we need to get an update, of course, where things stand. I hinted at a couple data points that have been dropped on us as of late. But uh, David, like, how is the economy doing? Like, what what has changed over the last six months? Um, well, probably the thing that has changed is that um, you know the weakness that everybody thought was coming, including me, has been somewhat postponed there's there's weakness in the economy in certain sectors but the overall economy has been surprisingly resilient so um you know we're chugging along soft landing seems to be gaining more and more traction um and you know the feds feds sitting here looking pretty good because you've got uh you know so-called economy that's not dipping into recession and uh and inflation, despite yesterday's number, uh, still trending down. So, you know, they've they've caught a lot of flack for being too aggressive on hiking or from other people not hiking fast enough. And yet they're kind of, you know, they look like, uh, you know, the porridge is just right. They've, <laughs> they've kind of walked the line here and done it pretty well. So up to date, now I'm not sure that's going to hold true over the next year, but up to date, you got to give Paul kudos for you know doing this pretty well. Yeah, absolutely, I yeah, know it's, it's a question I've asked other two other guests in the past as well. And I think it's an interesting question: is uh, what kind of school grade would you give uh, Jerome Powell right now, based on uh, how how the Fed has been acting? Because uh, I hate to say it, because I, I used to be also in the other camp, but they've been spot on so far. Yeah, I'd have to say up till now, I I'd certainly give them you know B, B plus A minus. You know, there's there's i have real concerns that they're over tightening so that's not uh and and there are lags to when you see you know what happens with the policy so so i'm not saying they are doing it right but based on up to date you'd have to give them very high marks yeah absolutely well they're, they're very data dependent as well of course and uh, they follow the data and so far the data is proving them right and uh, their their whole steady course seems to be the right way to go although powell has been quite dovish um of course in december and then yet again uh, just just recently in an interview i think it was his uh, not uh, interview but uh, his uh, testimony and i think it was in front of the senate where he said uh, we're just waiting for the right moment to, to cut rates. So again, re extremely dovish. Um, and I've watched Bloomberg surveillance this morning, David, and I have to steal a question. I, I forgot who asked it on, on, the, on the channel, on the program. But uh, is, is Jerome Powell a very poor communicator or is he just that dovish? Actually, I think he's a very good communicator. He, he, people keep trying to read between the lines with him. I think he's very sincere and straightforward in terms of what he's trying to accomplish and what he's, you know, what their policy is. Um, you know, the problem is people have a narrative and if it doesn't, if he's not saying what they want him to say, they criticize him and yet they ought to look in the mirror. Um, so 
at least, like I said, up till now, he's right. And and what I give him credit for, to my side of things, is he's not getting caught up in the month to month number and say, oh, you know, we're up a tick. We've got to now we're we're going back to the tight side, or we're you know we're beginning to. He basically has has held the course. You know, some some of his other members on the committee kind of bounce around, but he's held the course and said. We're not ready to cut yet, but we think cutting is coming this year. And, you know, I think that's exactly – yesterday didn't change that, I don't think. No. Well, the question is, and David, maybe on you know based on your um, insights as well, like how many rate cuts are we going to see? The Fed forecast three, which seems more and more likely. The market got extremely ahead of itself, said, well, let's see, maybe six to seven. Uh, there, the market has been reeled in. We're back to three to four, maybe 100 basis points at best uh, by year end. Question is timing now as well. Uh, obviously, 99% of the market believes it's not going to happen the next week. Uh, June maybe a bit more likely. Uh, others are predicting maybe after the election. So that's only leave, leaves one rate cut in December. What what camp are you in? Where, where are you putting your eggs? Yeah, frankly, I'm uh, as a, as a uh, macro strategist. I just don't play the trading game of, you know, how many cuts is it? And, um, you know, that makes for a lot of nice fodder. And certainly the traders pay attention to it because it gets reflected in, in the futures market, et cetera. Um, I, I think the jury's out on that. It's going to depend on how fast I'm calling for a global bust to follow this melt up. Depends on how fast that comes along. If it comes before the end of the year, uh, they may be cutting sooner than, you know, than the, or faster than they think. Um, if this soft landing kind of stretches out through the the year, you know the cuts are going to come next year. There are going to be big cuts. I mean, I'm you know I'm forecasting a big drop in rates. I think you'll see negative short rates, including Fed fund rates, by the end of this whole thing. But how how we get there, what path we get there, you know, it's going to be dependent on the next several quarters of of growth and um and when this thing comes to an end because i i do think under the surface the economy's starting to show signs of decelerating you know the certainly there are things that are problematic but on the other hand what's ironic is you're about to have you know you're getting rates coming down you know they they came down from five to 380 back to four 435 440 and now you know back under that i think ultimately in the next you know probably in the second quarter you'll see rates down towards three percent and maybe even down to two and a half in in the next three to six months um what that's going to do is it's going to stimulate housing again right and probably stimulate some other durable goods purchases etc so you may actually have a situation where the economy get stronger even though we're trending towards more problems um just because of the rates you know when inflation being under control etc um you know so i i just think it's a it's an ebb and flow process in the markets an ebb and flow process in the economy and too many people i think try to draw conclusions from very short-term movements absolutely yeah uh, you, you meant housing and to one you know, comment I wrote down was home, uh, home purchases have jumped up again because mortgage rates just dropped a little bit. It's like I don't have the exact number in front of me, unfortunately, yeah. but, but uh, that it's already newsworthy means that there is action in, in the housing market already, meaning house prices is not coming down. And I think that's reflected in uh, the, the number we saw yesterday, the CPI, because shelters jumped up a little bit as well um, in, in that inflation number. Well, that's a problem because shelter, as it's reflected in and the CPI was never, it should have come down over the last year in the CPI and the way they calculate it, it was holding up much firmer while the, you know, uh, the Zillow numbers, et cetera, were showing that housing, both home prices and, and activity were coming down, rents were starting to roll over. So we, we, you know, I don't know whether there's going to be a lag to that in the CPI or whether they're just going to skip over that and go back to, hey, things are firmer. Um, But if that's the case, the CPI is going to bias in it that is, you know, um, miscalculating inflation. So um, but, yeah, I I think you're going to have a spring housing market um, that's stronger. you got pent up demand there and supply, even though it started picking up because things got sluggish over the winter. 
Um, there's not a lot of inventory and the home builders continue to do well because there isn't a lot of inventory and there are people who are afraid to miss the market cycle, the, the housing cycle that are going to end up paying at the top of the market as they always do. So I think it's short lived. I think it can you know last the next three to six months. Um, but beyond that, housing's a problem. I mean, I think housing's uh, going to get hit very hard next year. I was going to say, are those by the dip buyers in in, in housing? Yeah. They see a little dip yeah. in, in the mortgage rate. It's like, okay, we have to. Um, a, maybe they're forced into it, but B, they just see that opportunity because it com comes back to the higher for longer discussion maybe as well. Um, maybe they do see rates at a higher level and now they decide to pull the trigger as it is dipping a little bit maybe. Yeah, if you've got mortgages over 7% and it shuts down a lot of those people that were looking to buy, if you get mortgages back down under 6%, and maybe even down to closer to five, um, those people think they get a bargain. You know, they go, oh my God, you know, we can afford it again. And they're afraid that that window is going to close. So they're going to jump on and you're going to get a, you know, like I said, a three to six month period of kind of a concentrated buying period that's not sustainable. But um, because there is, you know, even though I'm calling for rates. You know, you could even see a 2% mortgage rate next year if, if the 10-year goes to zero, as I'm forecasting in the in the bus. But at that point, it's not going to be rates-driving activity. It's going to be the economy. And at that point, if we have a global bus, you know, you're not going to have a, a strong housing market. You're going to have a very weak housing market. So so rates, but for now, if you, you know, if the economy is holding in there and rates come down, you know, 100 or 200 base points, all of a sudden you've got, um, you know, some pent up demand that's coming back in. So I think temporarily you're going to see, you know, lift there. But so what I think you end up having here is kind of the best of all worlds. The economy is holding in there and, and yet inflation's trending down and, and rates are trending down. And that certainly is good for the markets. Oh, absolutely. As we saw yesterday as well, new new record high in the S&P 500. I think we're trading at 5180 now. So we were just joking about last week, uh, pretty much about S&P 5000, instead of calling yeah, it S&P right. 500, right? So um, it, market is moving quickly. Um, and, and we'll get to that because I want to get, of course, your opinion on the current status of the melt up uh, uh, scenario that we're in right now. But uh, one, one last question sort of on the Fed and uh, Fed rate hike cycle and scenarios. Um, there, there's a quote from the from the Financial Times that I picked up this morning. And uh, it is that there is a risk per, uh, that persistent inflation and the Fed's response to it might turn a soft landing scenario into a soft stagflationary one. So I'm curious uh, what what that means. Maybe you can interpret that because you you mentioned soft landing scenario is more likely. Maybe not. We're not even getting a no landing scenario at this point. That's what the data is telling us. So stagflation means high inflation but weak economy. Is that more likely right now? I don't think so. I think that's what you get when you get people reading month to month numbers, you know, these things don't go in a straight line. So, you know, you've got a little more strength in, in inflation short term. Um, like I said, it may be overstated if because of what they're doing with housing, which is such a big component. But, you know, my my view, and again, I can be wrong, but my view is that inflation is trending towards that 2%. And ultimately, next year in a global bust, you're going to see deflation for a short period of time. So I think inflation is not our problem. Um, the Fed's trying to walk a fine line. I actually think they're fighting the last war. The, you know, deflation's our risk here, not inflation. But, you know, they're right, because if they jump too soon, uh, like I said, we're going to see the, you know, we're going to see things um, like housing and things go the other way anyway here. If they jump too soon, it just, you know, it's off to the races and then they've got a tougher job on their hands. So it's it's a hard situation because the Fed has to, on the one hand, understand their leads and lags, but on the, on the other hand, understand that markets respond so quickly to what they do. So um, I, I think ultimately um, the story is the same. We're trending down in, in the economy, trending down in inflation. And however, you know, for a matter of months, that may not look like that's correct. During our last conversation at the end of September, uh, Dave, you, you mentioned that the Fed is not considering future downturns enough, perhaps. 
um, in, in, in their forecasts and calculations and maybe rate predictions as well. Do you, do you, do you see a change there? Because there's so much happening on, on the geopolitical front, for example, um, just the Red Sea debacle right now that we're seeing and, uh, you know, the Strait of Oman apparently is being flooded with warships from uh, Iran, China and Russia. So I'm curious uh, what, what your thoughts are. Is that something we should consider as well? Or should the Fed consider as well? I think the Fed will tell you they, they feel they've got to focus on the economy and focus on their mandates and that they're, you know, they're, if they start getting distracted by trying to predict what, you know, what the potential of a war is or, you know, the impact of higher oil prices, et cetera, you know, they'll, they'll look at it and understand that it's an added risk. But I think they're right to say, hey, that's not our expertise. That's not our mandate. Let's focus on what we we know is our job and um and again the markets love to throw in all these curveballs and what's going to happen and speculate on you know whether this is going to cause calamity etc you don't want the fed doing that i mean i i think that would lead to a much more uh reckless policy and certainly one that would you know, green from one direction to the other very quickly. So uh, I'm back again. So I, I, I think you've got a steady hand at the Fed, in my opinion, right now. Um, you know, I'm not a consensus guy, obviously, but, you know, Fed committees tend to be consensus. And I think they, you can see from the time Powell's had leadership there, they mostly go along with him. Uh, but he allows them all to express their views. And then, you know, as the Fed has always done, reach consensus. Um, so, I, I mean, it's funny because I end up being the defender of Powell, even though I've been a, one of his bigger critics over the years. Um, he was very green early on. You know, he's a financial guy, not an economist and not a Fed guy, really. Um, and early on, going back several years, you know, he was making some major mistakes but he learned a lot, and I think he's one of the best communicators we've ever had at the Fed. No, fantastic. Like, David, I, I wanted to move away from the Fed, but I, all my questions that keep popping up in my head keep coming back to the Fed and uh, trying to bridge the gap now a little bit between the U.S. Uh, debt, uh, U.S. elections, and the Fed, right? So, um, like, how should the Fed, like, sort of take that into consideration? I know they shouldn't, but are they, in your opinion, especially given that we're in election year as well, which could become a really hot topic of debate here in the next, uh, what is it, it's March, November, next eight months here? Yeah, they've got a tough job. I, I think they have shown themselves to be pretty non-political, um, you know, I'm sure he gets pressure from um, Brainerd and the Biden administration, their economic policy team, Yellen, et cetera. Um, but I think they're trying to do their job. The problem is, as you get closer to uh, September, you know, the fall, you're, you're going to have to uh, consider that you're right on top of the election. So I, I think... Um, if, if we're in a place where it's kind of unclear what to do, you know, where you can favor one way or the other, they may sit on their hands in the fall. However, if we get to August, September and the economy is starting to really unwind, um, and that could happen, I mean, you know, beginning to go the other way, um, they may have to say, Hey, well, you know, we're going to be accused of being political here, but we got to do what we got to do. Well, on the other hand, if inflation's ticking up and, uh, you know, the, let's say we've had a strong housing market through the summer and, you know, the market's, as I say, up near 7,000, I think they could tighten in spite of the fact that there's, you know, presidential election in just a few months. Um, because I think they really worry that if they ignore certain things and the genie gets out of the bottle, it's going to be a lot harder to get it back in there, meaning inflation. So, so I think, you know, I think it's anybody's guess right now what, what comes at the end of the summer. I would not just assume the Fed's going to sit tight okay. and say hey, we can't do anything for a few months. No, no I'm curious. Like I'm trying to, you know, 
catch glimpses of it like based here in Germany. So I'm trying to follow U.S. news, of course, a little bit and uh, different, uh, you know, candidates' uh, perspectives on the Fed. And I think Trump and Powell are not best friends as far as I remember. So uh, curious uh, what, what that really means moving forward as well, right? Um, David, I, I want to sort of chronologically work through a bit through your previous forecasts and future predictions here as well. Um, one, one thing you mentioned in the intro was that we, weakness is postponed. Um, so now I'm curious, of course, like where do you see weakness sort of to occur uh, occur at some point? And uh, we, I want to talk about that bust scenario that uh, you, you've mentioned. Yeah, well, I guess even in Europe, you're seeing some signs of, of better. <laughs> I just think there's an ebb and flow. And, you know, as I say, the pandemic caused a lot of um weakness underneath the surface uh, for what I call fragility underneath the surface. So even though statistically things look much better uh, and we seemingly are on a normal path, I think, you know, certainly in this country, small business took it on the chin during, during the uh, pandemic and have only partially recovered from that. Um, you know, don't forget for a, for well over a year, I don't remember whether it was almost two years, but you know, Walmart and Target were were your destinations for shoppers, and small businesses was told, "Hey, you can't open." Um, and so, you know, that takes a toll. We lost a lot of businesses. Obviously, you're you're coming back from that, and the way we calculate things, it looks great, um, or looks pretty good. Um, but underneath the surface, there's Still plenty of fragility from you know companies or small businesses etc that uh have some imbalances to work through um looking at it from a kind of top-down macro perspective um central banks if i'm right uh, are not understanding just how long the lag is to inflation so if they sit here and say well we we are going to remain pretty um, restrictive or at least somewhat restrictive until we see the the actual targets we're looking for, 2% on inflation here and whatever Lagarde's looking for, um, you're almost guaranteeing you're, you're overstaying your welcome on the tight side. So I think from a monetary standpoint, and I am somewhat of a monetarist, I think you're, you're looking at sometime this year uh, a place where all of a sudden, you know, the there's a hiccup in the economy where you you can go from th seemingly things being pretty good to all of a sudden being surprised that things are rolling over pretty fast and and we have a financial fragility i mean you know more so overseas with the you know european banks for example um but even here um you know it's it's not all just great and you know loan demand is has been suppressed because of policy um that all take its toll on the economy at some point so um and and the consumer has kind of you know worked through all that savings that built up during the pandemic because of a lot of handouts etc um and obviously we're seeing delinquencies starting to move up um on you know particularly on autos, um, you know, as I said, bank loan demand has been suppressed. So all those things point to an economy, that, yeah, so far is holding in, but, you know, can, can roll over at some point. What are some of the main factors like you're, you're, you're looking for or indicators that you're looking at, David? I know I think we talked about that in September as well, but just to reiterate, uh, is it the housing market? Is it the commercial real estate? And I don't want to put words in your mouth, obviously, but uh, I'm, I'm German and I always look for the headlines when I wake up in the morning. OK, where is the straw that's breaking the camel's back here that might uh, you know force the Fed into action or that might just uh, tumble over the markets? Yeah, well, I've, I have said one, one thing that I think is a possible scenario, it's not a forecast, um, is that if we get some of this strengthening I'm talking about in housing and, um, you know, let's say, let's just draw a scenario that, that I'm right, that the melt-up um, gets us 7,000 by the summer or something pretty good, gets us over 6,000 certainly and on its way to seven. Um, and, you know, the Fed's looking at that. They're looking at, you know, housing heating up again. They're looking at the economy still hanging in there. Um, and inflation could be, even if inflation's 
uh, flat to where we are now or even um, down some from here, they may still say, you know, there's just too much uh, speculation in the markets. Um, we see signs in things like copper as a commodity or um, housing as, as a, uh, an industry where things are just saying, we, if we're not careful here, we could have another breakout in inflation. You might see them actually, even if they've already started cutting, go the other way. So let's say by, that's why I said you could be, you know, next fall looking at them hiking in the face of an election, not because they're trying to hurt Biden, but because they really say, we don't want to make the mistake we did last, you know, back in 2022, where we dragged our feet on inflation and thought it was, you know, transitory and then paid a price. It took us a lot more time here to work it down. We've done all this good work. We have to respond quickly. So, so I have a scenario where you could actually see the Fed, even like I said, even if they've started cutting, going back the other way and tightening as the economy is starting to roll over. And that would be a recipe for disaster, I think, because, you know, as I said, I think the Fed's been too tight, even though it doesn't show up yet. And then you add to that, you know, further tightness. And again, it probably will be mimicked by the ECB and maybe other banks um, so that you could have kind of like the 1930s situation where they should have zigged and they zagged, you know, the Fed should have zigged here and they zagged. Um, and, you know, so you got the kind of the lagged effect of policy already. And then just when they should be saying the opposite, they tighten uh, or doing the opposite, they tighten. So if you get that where, you know, you get a temporary, you know, I have a forecast that you could see two and a half percent on the 10 year by this summer. Um, you might see it go back from two and a half to three and a half or four um, before it, you know, the bus takes it down towards zero. So that you could get that, you know, for several months to tick up in, in rates, tick up in, in um, things that are restrictive. And then, uh, you know, you get the kind of double whammy of the lagged effect of previous policy along with, you know, a very bad uh, reaction here. And, and down goes the economy, down goes the markets. And the other thing to remember is markets tend to lead. So we could see a top in the market by mid-year or a little after. Um, you know, I tell people I can't. You know, this is a, what I think is a 41-year top. Um, I can't know which month it's going to top out. So I'm not trying to say it has to happen then. But if it does... Uh, let's say top out by this summer, um, it could roll over, you know, 20, 30% in an initial reaction, looking over, you know, looking past what the Fed may be looking at. The Fed's focus, as you say, on current data, which is really past data, um, current data releases, which are telling you what happened, not what's going to happen. The markets are focused on things that are maybe six, six or nine months out. And so the market could be part of that beginning of the rollover in the economy. No. It's interesting. You, said, you mentioned a 20 to 30% uh, correction, which would still take us to 4,000 to 4,500 points in the S&P 500, which is, I think is still extremely high personally, right? So uh, if you look at history and uh, historical price developments here. Um, yeah, I'm just saying that might be your initial reaction. I'm, I'm obviously calling for an 80% decline okay. after the melt-up. So I think an 80% bear market. So that would be just the first step down. And it might be 20%. It might be 40%. I have no idea. But yeah. I'm just saying, you know, that is a potential scenario that could also be part of the problem. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, a couple of things you mentioned I want to follow up on is, A, of course, the bond market. Because the bond market is also a bit of a safe haven investment. That's where everybody is running to. So as uh, as the stock market crashes, everybody's running into bonds. Is that uh, sort of the prediction? Is that still the same function that we've seen year over year over year? Um, does that still hold true? Yeah, I think you have to separate out treasuries uh, from corporates and certainly high corporate, um, you know, high investment grade from low investment grade and below. Um, because as if I'm right that we're heading for a global bust, at some point the bond market will start discounting the problem 
um, and you'll see a big jump in spreads. So I think treasuries will be one of the few, the very few assets that hold up in the bust and actually appreciate during the bust while everything else is getting hit very hard. Um, but, um, you know, there's a period here where I think all bonds are going to do well. Um, so they're, you know, again, probably coinciding with the stock market. So, you know, corporates, um, treasuries, et cetera, even junk, I think will continue to um, appreciate here probably into the summer. Uh, and then you start looking, you know, beyond that and say, okay, now we're going to start seeing a, you know, diversion or a divergence between, you know, treasuries and the corporates. Gotcha. David, I can't get away from the Fed for some reason. All my questions keep coming back to it. And uh, the, the last one, I hope it's the last one, is uh, j just the, the signaling and the symbolism of a, of a rate cut. Even if it's just 25 basis points, which we probably can uh, agree on, will not do much uh, overall. It's just a symbol. It's just a signal. But the question is, like, what does that signal really mean? Because it shows that the, the Fed is convinced that the economy is weakening, right? So I'm curious if that's maybe the... That the spark that sets off that bust scenario, perhaps, right? So I'm curious what that meaning of that could be. Yeah, I I disagree with that. There, I know there's a narrative and a very popular narrative out there. Um, I've seen many a pundit push it that rate cuts are the start of a bear market. That basically the market tops out with the first rate cut or thereabouts. And first of all, if you listen to Powell and look at what the Fed's doing. They're saying we feel like the economy is not going into recession, um, but we feel like we've made a lot of progress on inflation. And so we think we may be able to cut in spite of the fact that we're not looking for a recession. So everybody's got this black and white thing. If the Fed cuts, it means we're heading for disaster. If the Fed doesn't cut, um, it means the economy is OK. They, they're looking at they have two mandates. One is the economy and one is inflation. I don't, I just don't believe um, that a rate cut is the beginning of it. As I've, I've said many times, my melt up call does not uh, count on Fed cuts. So I'm not saying that Fed cuts are the reason we're going to get a melt up. On the other hand, I don't think rate cuts signal a top in the market. Um, you know, it's later on when you get you know, sustained rate cuts because it's very obvious the economy is rolling over like you saw in 2008. That's when, yes, um, you know, rate cuts are not a bullish thing. But I'm looking at the bond market. The bond market, if, if the Fed stood here and didn't cut at all, I'd still be saying 7,000 on the S&P because the bond market's moving ahead of the Fed. The Fed is a group of... Um, policymakers making a judgment on the economy, just like every other uh, economist and, and uh, strategist out there. They're human beings, and, and frankly, they're government bureaucrats to some extent, and you know, not necessarily market-savvy people. So they can be you know, very slow to make changes. I'm not sitting around saying the market's going to wait for that. The market's smart enough to see things themselves. I, I think the market's a much better uh, forecaster than any one of the people sitting in the um, you know FOMC. So, so um, you know they they I do believe they're probably going to be cutting here you know by before mid year, but I'm not worried about whether they do or don't, and I'm not I'm certainly not saying the end of um, you know market top is signaled by their cut particularly if it's a quarter percent or even a half percent, you know, it's, it's when you start seeing them, you know, saying we've got to cut a lot more aggressively, um, you'll have already known, I think, as a marketplace that things aren't good out there. Yeah. No, absolutely. No, I appreciate that. Thanks for clarifying that. And I love having controversial, uh, contrarian views, not controversial. That was the word I was looking for earlier as well, was contrarian, not controversial. Um, but uh, you, you mentioned bonds and other assets will be sort of surviving the bust scenario or will be holding up decently well in the bust scenario. Question now is, what are the other assets, David? Yeah, basically, there are three, you know, in the U.S. anyway, there are three assets that I think will hold up. Um, it's treasuries, and that's all treasuries across the curve. So 
everything from T bills out to you know the long bond. Um, I, and obviously, the longer the duration, meaning the longer the maturity, um, the um, the probably the more appreciation you'll see if I'm right about rates. You know, if if rates fall in a deflationary bust to the extent I think they will. You know, we'll have new lows on interest rates. Uh, you know, I think the majority think that we saw the the bottom in rates back in um, 2020. Um, you know, when when we got to back in March 2020, when we got to 0. 0.4 on the 10 year. I actually think, like I said, that we could go to zero on the 10 year and and negative rates on short rates, shorter rates. Um, but it'll be short lived, and then we'll start a, a very long bear market in bonds. You know, long rise in rates over the balance of the decade. So, but during the bust, I think you get there. So all treasuries, I think will hold up and actually, you know, appreciate. Um, and then I think the dollar, although I'm very bearish to the dollar here and think, you know, DXY can fall to 80, which is a huge drop from here. I do think during the bust, um, the dollar will get bid up as it always does during, you know, global, crisis um and i think you could see a dollar do a full retrace back to 120 uh from 80 and maybe even higher than that um as people flee to safety um people around the world say hey you know <laughs> yes the u.s had problems but they have a lot less problems than the rest of us um so the dollar would be the second thing and then at least in the u.s um i tell people i believe the fdic will be given any amount of money they need to meet their liability. So FDIC insured savings accounts um, will be, you know, be safe, um, you know, up to the limits of 250, 250,000. Um, so I, I think that will happen, you know, above that, not necessarily, you know, policies could be put in during the bust, uh, both here and around the world to protect the consumer and say, we're going to do this temporarily you know, not break the buck on money market funds, et cetera. But we don't know that. And there's some resistance to doing that again, I think. But my guess is when push gets shoved, uh, push comes to shove, you're going to see um, the governments step in and do whatever they have to do to kind of prop up consumers and prop up the economy. But, you know, I say global bust because I think it'll be worse in 2008, nine. Uh, I think we're going to have a financial crisis unlike anything we've seen in the post-World War II era, meaning big bank failures, et cetera. <clears throat> and I do think um, central banks are going to be slow to just repeat the, you know, they, they are convinced they made big mistakes back in 2020 and um, they're, they're not going to be quick to want to just, you know, do QE and, and pump it up. Ultimately, as I, you know, this is my thesis, ultimately, um, if you get a free falling financial system, which is what I, why I call it a bust uh, around the globe, there's only one policy tool that can stop that. And that's money like we've never seen before. So I'm predicting you could see 20 trillion come out of the Fed. So we did 5 trillion in, in the response to the pandemic. Um, 20 trillion would be 20 trillion would be four times that um, again it's just my guess and I obviously don't know and proportionally something similar to that around the world so we would be seeing money like we've never seen not not even close and of course 2020 was like we had never seen so so um, I think they'll be slow to respond but then when they realize this thing's falling apart and we better save it. Um, you will see them panic in ways we've never seen before. So, uh, you know, it's again, if you were to sit any one of those governors down today, they would say, no way. There's not even a thought that they could do that. They're saying, we want to do the opposite. You know, we want to, you know, we want to restore integrity to, to the system. We don't want to just blow it up again with more money. That's all, that's all great in theory. But when you're sitting in their shoes and not just, central banks but also the governments and you're watching a, a world about to just implode 
you don't sit there and say, hey, in theory, this could cause inflation. You say, what do we what do we have to do? Just like we saw in 2020, we saw programs we had never seen before because they're panicked. They said, we got to we got to save the system. So I think you'll see um, that's that's what I think is coming. No, absolutely. I really agree with that. And uh, Dixie 80 points out a massive problem and a massive in insecurity around the US dollar, massive maybe flooding of the market again with US dollars as well. Um, David, I was fishing for a little bit of uh, a segue to commodities as well, but you didn't touch on commodities as one of the asset classes, perhaps. So now I have to open that can of worms as sort of our last topic of debate here. It is commodities. We need to talk about the precious metals. Last time you were on, you made a gold call of about 3000. We're on our way there. We just uh, broke through technical limits uh, levels here, uh, just, just of, as of last week. And of course, you brought up copper a little bit earlier in the conversation. So um, let, let, let's start with gold. Are you still sticking to the $3,000 call and uh, what, what could be driving it? And of course, as a follow-up to your last answer, why isn't it one of the asset classes that we'll be holding up? Yeah, I think gold Gold is, my, my target remains the same, 3000 on gold. Um, I, I think I could be conservative, and I use the term pre-bust uh, with that target. So there's not a, you know, it's not tied to a particular time frame this year. But I think, you know, again, if the bust hits before the end of the year, I think gold tops out pretty much at that point um, or soon thereafter. But so it's a pre-bust target. I, you know, we did just break out of all-time, you know, to all-time highs. I think we're starting a very big bull market in, in gold. It's been, you know, it's been in a consolidation for several years. Um, we obviously had a big run post pandemic, you know, March to or April to August of 2020. And it's been, you know, it's been kind of trying to move up and out of this consolidation for a while. We've topped out at the highs, you know, three times and we finally pushed through. Um, I'm very bullish gold and, and the miners that go with it. Um, they're lagging and obviously a lot of people pretty soured on the miners um, because they have lagged so badly. Um, but I think they will, as, as gold moves up, you'll see more and more money come into that space. Um, same thing with silver. Silver's lagged a lot more than gold. I mean, gold's broken out here. Silver, Silver's high is up at, what, 48 maybe? Um, and is currently 24 there, but 24 and change. So there's a long way to go, and you know, basically a doubling just to get back to the highs. I actually think silver is probably going to push to 60 in this move, so pre bust. Um, and I've said it could even go as high as 75. Uh, once it pushes beyond the highs, we'll see how you know how sharp that move is. Um, and again, the silver miners, same as the gold miners, I think, um, you know, they've lagged a lot. There have, you know, people are still selling them. You're still seeing the, you know, it's funny. You're seeing the ETFs in, in the metals as well as in the miners not get a lot of sponsorship yet. I think people are skeptical, and that's a good sign, you know, from a bull, bull perspective. Um, you know, longer they, they wait to really catch that fever, uh, the better. Yeah, I was at and, and in, Go ahead. I'm sorry, in terms of copper, I've been out there, way out there. I mean, there's nobody else I think even been bullish on copper. And I've been saying we'll see six dollar copper pre bust. So uh, it is Dr. Copper, you know, certainly is tied to the economy uh, to some extent. But it's also it's just in such tight supply. I think China has had a bearing on it, obviously, and, and concerns about China's economy, et cetera. Uh, the fact that it's breaking out above four dollars, I think, is a sign probably that China's beginning to get more aggressive about trying to turn their situation around. Um, and uh, I think I think copper can run from four to six dollars here, um, you know, in the next six months possibly. So I'm pretty bullish on on pretty much all the all the um, basic you know the metals. No, fantastic. Um, Dave, well, maybe you have an answer for me here, because I was at the uh, world's largest mining conference last week in Toronto, the PDAC, and we were walking the floor, and nobody really had an explanation why gold all of a sudden broke out last week, uh, or late the week before on the Friday. Um, 
you know, touching on twenty two hundred dollars. Any inkling, any idea, or um, you know, thoughts on what why gold all of a sudden just pulled out? Because there wasn't a lot of macro news that could have triggered that. I personally think dollar is the key to this run in in gold. Obviously, I have probably the most bearish view on the dollar, and I've been watching it obviously for a while uh, closely. And I, I just think people are, you know, you, you see it in the markets on a day to day basis. You get a little weakness in the dollar and, you, you know, gold lifts its head. Um, and I, I think technically the dollar, not necessarily in the next week or two, you could see the dollar. Um, I see some signs that the dollar could bounce here one more time. But I think we're getting closer and closer to that point where the dollar is going to break back down. We've been in a, you know, what I call a counter, ten, counter trend consolidation for a while. Um, and, you know, people have been frustrated by the dollar staying up here so much. Um, I just view it as it'll, you know, it'll figure out when it wants to roll over. And when it does, it's going to roll over hard. So I think there's some sign of that. Certainly, technically, the gold breaking out and this time sustaining instead of being up there for an hour and then <laughs> breaking down. Um, I think people are, you know, there's a lot of technicians following gold or a lot of gold investors are technically oriented. So I think that's part of it. The chart looks great. Um, I think that's all part of it. Um, and and basically, if you step away from the dollar and look at the, the you know, the other currencies that the dollar trades off of, um, and particularly Japan, uh, the yen, there is a lot of signs that we're at a very big inflection point. The dollar downward and, and these other currencies, including the euro, the yen, uh, British pound, um, Canadian dollar, you know, Aussie, um, I think they all look like they've got plenty of room to run on the upside. So, you know, there may be people looking, you know, at that. I, I do all of that in terms of trying to, you know, I, I try to look at multiple markets and time in to some extent. No, absolutely. Next week is, uh, I think, really pivotal for the markets because we have the Bank of Japan meeting on Tuesday, the Fed meeting on Wednesday, and the Bank of England on Thursday. So uh, you just mentioned all three. So that should be a fun week. Uh, maybe we should catch up next Friday to see what the results are and right, uh, right. Uh, talk about that. But uh, David, announce your um, our interview on a, within the commu on the community page here of our YouTube channel, and we got two questions commodity related, um, which I just want to throw in here because it's fitting. Um, you, you made a call for the GDXJ of about 100 pre bust. Um, and the question is, like, can you run us a bit through that time frame of that happening in terms of market topping as well? And as a follow up to that, it's like when the market rolls over, what, what do you expect the junior miners to do? Yeah, that's still my target. And I've had that target for quite some time. So people are frustrated because they, they want it to happen sooner. Um, I, I don't see anything to change it. Um, it's, you know, basically a tripling from where we are. Um, and I think that's what you're looking at is if you get a move in gold from here to 3000 or higher, uh, between now and the end of the year, um, I think you'll see the miners, you know, have a huge move. Um, again, people forget how, how small the mining sector is. And if all of a sudden it's outperforming, the one thing I know, having done this for 50 years, is that there's a lot of people out there as portfolio managers and as you know, um, market analysts, et cetera, that want to talk fundamentals, but ultimately what drives their bull and bear views is the momentum. If you get the momentum in, in both gold and the miners, um, you're going to have a lot of people who have stayed away from the metals and the miners coming in. And, and it's a very, a very thin sector when you have a lot of money trying to get in there and what will give is price. So you can have big moves. We've seen in the past, you can have big moves in, in the mining stocks in a hurry. And that's what I expect. No, fantastic. And I hope you're right, because, uh, of course, big part of my portfolio is in junior mining and exploration companies. So I hope you're right, David. Yep. Um, one last, very last commodity I'm going to ask you about, and then we're going to wrap up the conversation, Is and I'm going to use another community question here, is that can you ask David if he still sees oil going to $60 pre-bust and then before dropping to $30 during the bust? Yeah, I do. I'm uh, you know, Again, I've been the bear on oil um, right for a while, and then you, know, you get these counter-trend moves and people... 
who are more trading oriented want to call it wrong. And I just, I just go, I'm not, you know, I'm not worried about trying to call the next month in oil or the next, you know, you're going to have moves that move down, obviously the mid sixties. Now it's moved back towards 80. Um, I think the next move is down. Um, you know, I could be wrong and it could, push beyond my expectation here but i think we're at the high end of this trading range we've been in and we'll roll back over and i think 60 is still uh, a real possibility and i call that kind of the pre-bust period so um in the bust itself you know if you get a global economy that's worse than you know it, it is one of the worst we've seen in the post-world war ii era and we have a financial system that's in, you know, in a situation that hasn't been in post World War II era. Um, that's going to push oil demand down sharply, um, and I think there's more oil supply out there than people are willing to understand for. I, but that's one reason why I think I was correctly bearish, and most people were bullish on oil. Um, but I, I do think you're going to see thirty dollar oil in the bust, and I, you know, again. It, that's where I'm willing to go with it. It doesn't mean it stops there. It possibly even goes lower than that. Very short term, you know, it won't stay there. You know, I'm calling for $500 oil by the end of the decade. So, you know, it's just in this, the global bus is bad as it's going to be. I don't think it lasts much more than 12 to 18 months. Um, probably more likely 12 than 18. Um, so, you know, you can, you can get go down sharply, but you can go back the other way, you know, within a year of that. So, now, well, one thing I learned from the COVID crisis, I need to learn, or I, I need to learn how to trade negative oil. So, how, how can I get, <laughs> how, how can I trade oil at negative twenty five dollars, right? So, I wouldn't yeah, call it that, buying that oil anymore because they give I you was, money. So, <laughs> I was um, calling when oil was seventy eight prior to that. It might have been uh, eighteen months prior to that, but I, uh, at somewhere around seventy eight, I turned very bearish oil, and I said it can go down. Um, initially towards 40 and then, you know, sub 20, I may have even set 10. <laughs> I obviously didn't expect it to go, you know, those couple of days. You were where, way off, David. It was negative yeah, yeah, 25, you, right? You were way I off. I missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and most of us missed it if you blinked because it you know, lasted a day or whatever. But yeah. uh, that's what happens if you get into, you know, um, crazy uh, off balance markets, you know, that, um, no, I don't think any, I, yeah, I'd like to meet the person that traded it down there, but, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. At that point you wondered if the world was coming to an end. Yeah, absolutely. And it felt like at that at the time as well, cause nobody was on the road. So it seemed like a massive apocalypse just happened. So, um, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. David, I tremendously enjoyed that conversation, uh, or our conversation just now. Uh, just one last thing, uh, where can we find more of you? Sure. I'm on, uh, I'm on Twitter every day. Um, I, uh, my handle is at Dave H Contrarian. As I tell people, there are a lot of fake accounts out there. So just make sure it's um, Dave H Contrarian, not David, not a misspelled Contrarian, et cetera. Um, and the easiest way, I, I've got 196,000 followers. So the fake accounts typically have, you know, a small number of followers, less than a thousand or certainly not anything like 196,000. So look at that before you, you know, cause there are people out there not, I'm not alone. This is with anybody that has a pretty good following, you know, these fake accounts, uh, I don't know what they do in their lives, but they seem to get a kick out of trying to pretend uh, they're speaking for me. And um, you know, they'll say something that's uh, maybe close to what I say, but opposite or, all kinds of things. So just, or they'll try to make money pretending they're me. So just be aware there are fake accounts out there um, with with my profile picture and my profile, um, and just ignore that stuff. Report it if you can. Um, but I'm I'm on Twitter most days, um, replying to people. I don't do a lot of original posts. Um, I had one. I put one out the other day. Um, and had a lot of responses from people that said, we haven't seen you in a long time. I go, I'm on here every day. You must, you know, your, your setup is not looking at replies. It's just looking at original posts. No, fantastic. David, tremendously enjoyed the conversation. Really appreciate your time, of course. We're close to an hour uh, of, you know, of recording time here. Really appreciate it and uh, hope to have you back soon and uh, continue our discussion. Maybe follow along the markets and uh, see where we're at. 
Fantastic. Yeah, I was going to I was going to mention also that I do have an investment letter, oh, um, a macro letter that I put out quarterly. Um, yeah, I don't have a website, so people go looking for it and they can't find it. I go just direct message me on Twitter, and I'll provide details for those that are interested. It 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 is a you know subscription by subscription, so there's a cost to it. It's an annual cost, um, but if anybody's interested, uh, I've got lots of people that follow me. Um, but also get the letter and and tell me that you know even though I put out a lot on Twitter that there is enough in the letter that you know adds to the value. The, the real good stuff is in the letter, obviously. So um, appreciate it, David. Thank you so much, and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate you watching. Please leave a like, leave a comment. Um, also, let us know: Are we asking the right questions? Do we bring the right guests on? Are these interviews helpful to you? That uh, helps us refine the, uh, you know, our product and our interviews, of course. So let, let us know. And, uh, of course, share the video with your like-minded friends and investors. Really appreciate that. And uh, as promised, we'll be back with lots, lots more this week. Thank you so much for tuning in.